Hi everyone, uh, this is Matt Touchot with Intro Stats. Today we're continuing our discussion of p-value. So we've been working through sort of learning some of the basics of how a hypothesis test works. Last time we, in the last video we saw that sort of the ideas of p-value and how to read it, how to compare it to your significance level. Uh, but now I want to talk a little bit about how do you even calculate this thing? How do you calculate this p-value? Uh, last time we talked about the definition of p-value being so vital. So it's the probability of getting the sample data or sample statistic or more extreme by sampling variability if the null was true. So we're going to unpack this definition a little bit because this is really uh, gives us a blueprint in a lot of ways of how p-value is actually calculated. So there's sort of two main ways that uh, p-values are calculated. We have traditional approaches and we have sort of the more modern approaches to calculating p-value. I think I'm going to start with the more modern one. And uh, we sometimes call this randomized simulation or a randomization, um, a randomization uh, approach. So randomized simulation or simulation or randomization. So think about it this way. The p-value definition says that if the null was true, what would we be likely to see by sampling variability? Right? That's a key two key components to this. We have to see what sampling variability would look like if the null hypothesis was really true. So in a simulation, what's going to happen is they're going to sort of create sort of a simulated sampling distribution in a lot of ways. But it's under the premise that the null hypothesis was true. So if the null hypothesis was true, what kinds of random samples would I be likely to see from that population where the null hypothesis was true? So if the null hypothesis was true, what kinds of random samples would we get just by sampling variability? That's kind of the key idea behind a randomization approach. So let's look at this example and we'll kind of flush this out a little bit and you can kind of get the idea a little bit. And obviously this is all stuff that's really going to translate to the computers. We're going to have the computer programs do this. I like to use StatKey for uh, randomized simulation. I think it's fabulous. It, it works great. Um, so if we looked at a, let's suppose we had a known alternative hypothesis. This is an example we looked at before uh, that normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees, but nowadays some people are thinking that maybe normal body temperature is actually less than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So, the, so again, what the computer is going to do is it's going to assume the null hypothesis is true. So it's going to assume that normal body temperature really is 98.6 and then it's going to start drawing random samples or creating random samples under the premise that 98.6 is the population mean average. So we're assuming the population mean average is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and then we're trying to see what kinds of random samples would I get. So the computer would be taking random samples usually as uh, it'll have be the same sample size as whatever your original real sample data would be. And then it would calculate the statistics. So whatever statistic you happen to be measuring. So we're dealing with the mean, right? So obviously the one we'd want to compare it to is the actual sample mean. So the real sample data, we got a sample mean, that's with the X bar, of 98.26, right? That's the sample data. So this is a summary of what really happened. Now again, what the computer is going to do is it's going to simulate random samples under the premise that 98.6 is the population mean. So notice you'll start to get sample means. So it's going to take lots and lots of random samples. It's going to calculate tons and tons of random samples. I usually, when I do stack I do thousands of these. And, and then you, um, so if you look and think of each of these dots here as a sample mean. So these are all sample means that were created by the computer. And it's showing us what the sampling variability looks like for sample means. In a lot of ways, it's like I say, it's like a simulated sampling distribution under the premise that the null hypothesis was true. Notice how the center of the simulation is 98.6 because that's what I was assuming in the null hypothesis. Right? Remember when we learned about sampling distributions before, the center 
is usually the population value. Well, in this case, the population value that you're assuming in the null hypothesis. So our population mean we're assuming in the null hypothesis is the center of the distribution. But then now I can see that even though the center is 98.6, I got simulated sample means that are you know anywhere from 98.9 all the way to 98.2. Okay, so lots of uh, sampling variability here. So in a sense, this graph is what we expect to see by sampling variability if the null hypothesis was true, right? Going back to this definition. Now, now that we have that, we can try to see, well, what's the probability of getting the sample data, sample statistic, or more extreme by sampling variability? Okay, so the sample statistic, they're talking about the real sample statistic. So what, what really happened? Our real sample data gave us a sample mean of 98.26 degrees Fahrenheit. That was the real one. So the thing about simulation is you'll have, you know, hundreds or thousands of simulated sample means, but there'll only be one real sample mean. Or you'll see thousands of simulated sample percentages, but there'll be only one real one. So no, don't lose track of which one was your real sample mean. So the p-value is really this, right? The, the probability of getting this sample mean, 98.26. But then it has this other part, or more extreme. So let's kind of look at this. So this is about 250 samples here. Um, dots on the board here. Each dot is representing a simulated sample mean from a, from a, a random sample uh, under the premise that the null hypothesis was true. Now, if we find 98.26, here's that cutoff, 98.26. Now, the computer's going to look, now, if you notice, this was a, a less than was our, our alternative hypothesis, so this would be a left-tailed test. That's really important in your calculations, why you need to know if it's a left tail or right tail or two-tailed. Remember, less than points to the left in our HA, so that's a left-tailed test. So now we're going to look at, are there any times, any simulated sample means that were either 98.26 or less than 98.26? And there actually was two. So I got two sample simulated samples where the sample mean um, dropped below 98.26. There might not be any that were exactly 98.26, but I had two that were lower. Because think of it this way. If 98.26 is significantly different than the population mean 98.6, then anything farther out would be even more significantly different. So I need to in incorporate any simulated samples that disagree with the null hypothesis even more than my original sample data does. So it's not just the cutoff point, it's also anything else in the tail. And that's what they're referring to here of, of or more extreme in the definition of p-value. So if I had 250 total random samples, simulated samples, and two, only two of them were 98.26 or less, right, the sample, the sample uh, mean or less, then my p-value would be approximately 2 out of 250 or 0 .008. That would be my simulated p-value. Okay, so... Um, Probably this is the more, most direct way to find the p-value if you're talking about really getting at the definition of this directly. Okay, <clears throat> let's try to look at another one here. Now we're looking at a, um, a, um, a, pr a proportion uh, simulation. The null hypothesis was pi equals 0.5 and the alternative was pi or p is uh, not equal to 0.5. So um, this would be a two-tailed test, right? We, don't, we talked about that before. This would be a two-tailed test because it's not equal. So that's going to be very important in your p-value calculation. You have to consider both tails now, not just the right tail, not just the left tail, but two both tails. Now it's really important. What was my real sample data? My real sample data gave a p-hat, a sample proportion of 0.61. Now what the computer's doing going to do is they're going to create lots and lots of random samples under the premise that the null hypothesis is true. So the computer assumes the null hypothesis is true and then it creates lots of random samples based on that premise that the null hypothesis is true. 
And now what you get is again like this simulated sampling distribution. Notice that the center of the sampling distribution is pretty close to 0.5. That's because that's what the computer is assuming is true when it created all these samples. Now each dot up here they, they basically calculated a, a random sample and then they calculated the p-hat. They calculated the sample proportion for that random sample. So each one of these dots is a simulated sample proportion. Think of it like a p-hat. So I got 250 p-hats on the board here that the computer created. But there's only one real one. What really happened? That would be this one. The p-hat that really happened was 0.61. And that's where, that's where the p-value is going to come into play. Because the p-value wants to know what's the probability of getting this real sample data, this real sample p-hat, or more extreme. Again, this is sampling, this is a graph of sampling variability if the null hypothesis was true. So now I just got to think about, okay, well, where is 0.61 on this graph? Since that's my real p-hat. Well, 0.61 is about right here. Now remember, we have to find the probability of getting the sample statistic or more extreme, right? So I have to think anything that disagrees with the null hypothesis even further away from the null hypothesis. So not just the dots that were at 0.61, but all of the p-hats that were more extreme than 0.61, they're farther away from the middle than the 0.61 is. If I counted them, all the dots that came into the tail, it seems like there was about 48 of them. So 48 divided by 250 would be 0.192. So about 48 dots here. Now, remember, this was a, if this was a right tail test, this 0.192 would actually be my p-value. But it's not. It's a two-tail test. That means I have to incorporate also any simulations in the other tail that are also equally far away from the null hypothesis, in other words, from the center of the distribution. So if I look at all the, the um, these uh, simulated p-hats on the, in the left tail that are just as far away and counted them, I'd also get about 48 out of 250 or 0.192. So how do I get my p-value now? Well, you have to basically incorporate all of them. 